Good evening and welcome to the New York Society Library uh, for this very special event. I am Sarah Holliday, Head of Events, and I am only standing here to uh, go over a couple of points of business. Thank you for queuing the first one. <laughs> first of all, I'd just like to point out that the Odyssey takes place in the ancient world before there were cell phones. So let us please behave as though we are in the ancient world. We'll have amplification, but no cell phones. If you don't mind silencing them, that would be great. We do have copies of Dr. Wilson's translation of the Odyssey for sale from our friends from the Corner Bookstore in the Caluso Family Exhibition Gallery. I think there are only two copies left, so if you didn't get one coming in uh, uh, afterwards, and Dr. Wilson will be happy to sign copies after that. Um, you may have seen on your seat this fun little yellow flyer saying that if you've read this translation of the Odyssey, you're in the middle of it, you're enthusiastic about it, whatever, you're welcome to join us on Thursday, November 29th at 6 p.m. in the Bitrich Room, and we'll just do a very informal book club style discussion of it. Um, and that'll be facilitated by Janet Comrades Numero, who's a library member, author and author of Daughters of the Samurai, so that'll be a nice evening. Uh, and it's my pleasure to bring to the podium Donald McDonough, who is one of our repeat seminar leaders here at the library, and we'll introduce our main speaker. Thank you. Looking at this group, I knew it was going to be right, uh, packed, as a matter of fact. We're lucky right, uh, to have somebody who coming from Oxford, Balliol, and Corpus Christi, then going out to Yale, and now at the University of Pennsylvania, having translated Euripides, written the life of Seneca, and going on and on, right, coming to us with a superb translation of the Odyssey. Everybody here is probably been reading about our widely correctly applauded opening of the Odyssey, that Andra Moy and Venusa, Pelutra Borhoa Smalapola, suddenly becomes tell me about a complicated man. <laughs> and then at the very end of the work, right, when Athena is talking to him as he's to be making peace among his own friends, says, you're an adaptable fellow. <laughs> but maybe one of the things that I so much enjoyed about the right words that she chose was when Penelope is talking to her nurse who says, your husband's downstairs. She doesn't believe it, right? But she says right, uh, in Greek, right, he's come from Kekel Ilion. Ilion is the other name for Troy. And our speaker today, Emily Wilson, has done wonderful portmanteau word and said he comes from evil Ilion. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Emily Wilson. <laughs> introduced tonight as the first, um, first um, female in English translator of the Odyssey. Most people have probably seen some of the media coverage, so I thought maybe I should spend a couple of minutes and start talking about that, and then I'll move on to talking about what I was trying to achieve in doing yet another translation into English of this already very much translated part. Um, so it seems to me that some of the media coverage focused on my agenda has been um, so both, there were both pros and cons towards that. I think it's a great thing if that, um, if that coverage is opening people's eyes to the fact that um, social identities matter for the words we write, for how we speak, whether we're historians or journalists or translators or novelists or whatever it may be. Um, I think it's a good thing if there are young people, including non-male young people, who might be inspired to think I can be a classicist too. Um, but I also think there are certain issues with defining um, whatever I was trying to do in this translation exclusively by my gender, which has sometimes happened. Um, one thing is that it seems to put the headline in the wrong place. I think the headline should be really about why is the field of classical translation so male dominated in the English speaking world? It's not the case in other languages. There are plenty of translations of the Odyssey, and uh, there are several in French by women. There are, there's at least two, maybe more, into Italian by women. There's one by a woman in Dutch, there's one by a woman in Turkish, and so on. So it's, it's a problem with the specifics of the contemporary English-speaking world that the vast majority of the translations from ancient Greek and Latin, not just Homer, are by usually very old white men. So that's a small demographic. And it's a, it's a small demographic compared to the number of people who have PhDs in, in Latin and Greek. The 
slightly over half the PhDs in classics in the States are awarded to women, and yet there's this disparity. So I think it goes far beyond like, me and Homer, it's, but it's something we should talk about you know, in a broader way than just uh, Emily Wilson is a woman. And then another, pro another point I wanted to make about that is just that I think I, I get frustrated when interviewers ask me, as they almost always do, um, how does your unique feminine perspective um, open our eyes to new things in this poem? Um, why are you a woman? How, how you, must, you must really like the female characters, and then it's all about female characters. Um, I've listened to and read um, interviews with my predecessors, such as Robert Fitzgerald, Stanley Lombardo, Robert Fagels. They were never asked, um, you must have a unique masculine perspective. <laughs> they were just asked, asked you only about the male characters. So my, my, my general point in saying that is just that um, not all women are feminists, not all women have a, a perspective that's defined exclusively by their gender identity. The fact that I'm paying attention to gender roles and the complexity of the depiction of gender in this poem is something which I decided to do, partly because I've read quite a lot of feminist scholarship about the Odyssey and thought about it quite a lot. It's not predetermined by being a woman. Um, Okay, so I suppose to do that preamble because it's, it's very often, if people haven't read my translation, the thing they have in their mind is the Buzz Woman headline, so I thought maybe I should just talk about that first and get out of the way. We can also talk about some Q&A as well. So I'm going to try not to talk the whole time because I'd love to hear, hear questions from you, but I just wanted to talk a little bit just to set up um, why did I decide to take on this translation given that there were so many already out there. I was asked to consider doing it by Norton, who was, was a publisher I was already, I already knew this editor there because I'd been involved with the Norton anthologies of both world literature and Western literature. Um, and I was excited to consider doing it because I've always loved this poem. Um, ever since I was eight years old and I got to be in the elementary school production of the Odyssey, which of course was a shortened version for kids, <laughs> <laughs> I got to be Athena. And it was, absolute turning point in my life. It's wonderful to play the goddess of Athena. I was a shy kid, and it really made me realize how much the Greek myths had to say to me in terms of my own experiences of being at home, being in school, being alienated, being lost, trying to figure out what does it mean to, to have friends or be in, a, be in a community. And of course, like, the, the Odyssey has changed as I've changed and as I've grown up. I didn't read it the same way now as I did when I was eight. Um, but I think it's, it's a sort of amazing poem in, the, in that it is actually about how are you different and the same over time? How is, um, how, how is your relationship to home, to family, to communities, to people who aren't like you? How, is, how does that change at different moments in your life? Can you be like Odysseus and try and turn back so that 80 years, so that, so that 20 years can go by, you're still just the same, your home is just the same? Or is that not possible? I think it's about all these questions I think about all the time in daily life as well as intellectual life, about time, identity, um, about how to deal with people who aren't like us, about hiding, rage, growing up, grief, imagination, recognition. I also love how it's a poem that turns the, the very pragmatic or material details of everyday life, like furniture and moving through space, boats, weapons, trees, weaving, into these concrete symbols that define human and define relationships. And that it both has this concreteness and also this magicalness, that it's both a world where you're going to get very, very detailed descriptions about how every meal is made, and how people put on their sandals, but then also you know that at any moment a goddess could appear and then fly away like a, like a bird. But, and I also I love, love how it sounds, I love how Homeric Greek sounds when you read it out loud and when you read it. But loving the poem and deciding to, and wanting to keep on rereading it and be with it for another you know, 40 years is a different thing from deciding it's worthwhile to produce another literary verse translation in English. That's obviously a creative, writerly project and also a scholarly, interpretive one. It has all these different layers to it, it's a huge job, I knew it would take me at least five years. I knew it wasn't worth spending five years doing that unless there, there was actually something I would do that would be authentically engaged with the original in a way that wasn't exactly the same as what was already available. It wasn't worth it if I was just going to re replicate what had already been done. So then I did the exercise of just looking closely at a passage of the Greek next to a dozen or so of the most commonly read translations, and I realized doing that, there were things that I wanted to do that were not being done in the ones I was looking at. Um, it wasn't that they were all bad, but as I knew I had a vision for how to do it a different way. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of the things I wanted to do that, um, that, that were sort of definitional for the project. 
Um, and I should also just say that, that after, look, after doing that experiment, I then put all the other translations away. I didn't look at them for another five years. Since, I did, since publishing my translation, I've then gone back and done some close comparisons because people, I'm, more, I'm constantly talking to people who, who don't know Greek and want to know how is your translation different from X, Y, Z, other translation. So I wanted, to know, I wanted to know what the answer to that is. And I now know what the answer to that is in ways I didn't a year ago. Um, so one thing that, that drove me to want to do it in the first place right from the start was the awareness that um, a huge number of the most commonly read translations in English, uh, contemporary ones, are not in a regular meter. But it's very, that, that there are, a lot of them are in prose or else they're in free verse. They're laid, laid out like verse, but they don't have any kind of regular rhythm. Of course, as, as the introducer just emphasized, the original is in dactylic hexameter. Dactyl is a finger, so of course it has the long, short, short. And ramoi ennepe musapolutropon hosmalapolla. It's six all the way through, right? It's hexameters. It doesn't suddenly go into a different rhythm because the poet decided it would be nice to try some free words. Um, so it, it seems to me that, that to, to my experience of reading Homer in Greek, the rhythmical musical regularity of the language seems, seems essential to the experience of it. Of course, that's also part of the legacy of the oral tradition. This is a poem which emerged out of a centuries-long oral tradition from the period when the Greek-speaking world had no reading or writing, had no, had no alphabet. Um, so to translate it into, into a language which doesn't have a regular rhythm seemed to me to be missing a whole part of the experience. So I, I chose to use iambic pentameter instead of dactylic hexameter because they wanted to use the literary equivalent of dactylic hexameter. Of course, in, in English, in Anglophone verse, poets don't normally use hexameters for writing epic or writing drama. So I, I wanted to use the, the verse form that in English is the signals narrative verse. Another decision I made at the start, um, which I sometimes kick myself off because it's really difficult, was um, to make it the same length as the original in terms of lines. Because I was aware that um, both for Homer, but this is true for translations in general, there's always a temptation um, to make the translation longer than the original. Because of course you always know this word, it, has, it connotes things that no single English word connotes. So there are maybe 50 possible words I could use. Then we plonk down five of them, just to cover all my bases. And then you end up with a translation that's quite a lot longer than the original. And it, it's going to have certain advantages that you're able to say, this means this and this and this and this and this. But it also means that you lose the pacing. Again, in, just in the experience of reading Homer in Greek, it seemed to me that the propulsive forward movement, the rapidity of the narrative, that you're not actually given any time whatsoever to get bored, was a really important element I wanted to try and be responsible to. And I knew I couldn't do that unless I decide ahead of time I'm really going to pay very close attention to that. Because if I hadn't chosen to do it, it wouldn't have happened. Um, and then in general, I wanted to try and convey something of the directness of Homeric verse style. That Homer is composed in what is both a weird kind of Greek, because it's based on multiple different dialects from multiple different eras, but it's also not at all difficult. It's extremely easy, direct syntax. It's a lot of coordinated syntax rather than subordinated. So it's a lot of, and then he put on his sandals, and then he put on his cloak, and then he put on his tunic, and then he grasped his golden spear, and so on. But it's not a lot of complicated sentences of the kind you might get in Paradise Lost. So I wanted to have a kind of directness about the way that I tried to convey Homer's voice in English. I also wanted to avoid um, thinking, because Homer is very, very ancient, he has to have, speak in a language that's clustered up with archaisms because I don't think that actually conveys um, the way that Homer sounds, right? It's, it's, it suggests this is an English which sounds like Victorian English, but that Victorian English doesn't sound more like American Greek than <coughs> nowadays English, right? Neither one of them is like Greek. Um, I also wanted not to do a whole lot of foreignizing, foreign, of foreignisms. Um, I think there's a, there's a tendency among classicists um, to think that um, the, the kind of translation which replicates the experience of the intermediate student in Latin or Greek 101 or, or 201 is more authentic because it sort of shows you you can't quite understand this language. But as I said, I, I think Homeric Greek is not very difficult, and so therefore the, the decision to translate in a way that makes it more difficult than the original seems problematic to me. I didn't want to make it more difficult to read 
than the original is. I also wanted to try, in general, to, to have a range of different registers, including it could be whimsical, it could be cute, it could be funny, it doesn't have to be high-polluting, grand, booming epic all the time. Epic can include more than that. Um, I think the later history of English epic, and the fact that we have Milton, we have Pope's Homer, may make us think of epic style in terms that aren't necessarily truthful to how Homer sounds. I wanted to inject something of the conversational simplicity of other Anglophone poets in, into the way I wrote, rather than think it's all got to sound very, very grand all the time as if I'm constantly shouting at you. Um, my translation, I think, I want, but at the same time as, as saying I didn't want to be too bombastic, um, I also didn't want to be absolutely writing in the same way as I'm talking to you right now. Um, even beyond the fact that right now I'm not talking in iambic pentameter, I also <laughs> wanted to have some other markers that this isn't quite the same as, real, as normal speech. Um, so for instance, I avoided all contractions. I didn't, didn't have any instances of doesn't or couldn't, just as a way of marking this isn't um, necessarily always difficult in a vocabulary words kind of way, but it's marked as not quite the same as regular speech. The original, as I just said, is, um, is, an, is in a very artificial language, which is a, the product of a long oral tradition. It includes um, different dialects mixed in there. I agonized a lot about the fact that I felt I couldn't fully echo that. I couldn't do a translation that would be a mix of Chaucerian English with some um, Californian, with some Glaswegian, with some Cockney, and just mix it all together, even though that would have been kind of really fun to do. Because if I were to do that, I would also, I mean, you wouldn't all be here, so <laughs> nobody would read it. And, and it would also just lose what I was saying before about how Homer has this simplicity and directness, because it's actually based on a real tradition, rather than a tradition that I just made up in order to translate Homer. So I was aware that my, my language isn't going to be quite as mixed or weird or diverse as Homer's language is because that was just the, the payoff for getting the other things that I felt were essential, one of which was this simplicity and directness, and then other things that included emotional intensity and psychological interest, and that this poem is actually about things, that it isn't just about language things. Um, another, another element that I felt I had to do different things with, it's a challenge that faces any translator of Homer, is the fact that this is a poem based on oral tradition and therefore has a lot of repetitions, exact repetitions, and also formulaic set types for how a scene goes, when somebody gets dressed, when somebody puts on armor, and also different set epithets. Odysseus is always going to be one of a range of different things. It's going to be polyclas, polymechanos, poly polymetis, that um, particular words apply to particular things when they're in a particular metrical position in the line. Um, I played around with the degree to which I translate repetition by repetition. I have quite a lot of repeated elements, such as a lot of wine dark seas, wine dark seas, wine dark sea, and then here's another wine dark sea. Because I wanted to, to, the reader to have some flavour of this is quite a repetitious poem. But I didn't repeat as much as the original does, because I was aware that repetition can have a different um, set of meanings in a literate culture from what it means in a purely oral culture. But in a purely poly oral culture, you repeat things that really matter. Because that's how you have that's the only way to preserve it. You don't have to, you can't play it back later, you can't read it out loud later. Whereas in a, in a very literate culture like ours, repetition tends to mean either I am Gertrude Stein, I am Gertrude Stein, I am Gertrude Stein, <laughs> or else it means, more likely, it means this is a cliche and I'm just repeating it because I haven't bothered to think of a different way to say it. So it doesn't matter and you can skip. And I don't think that repetition in Homer means either of those things. So I therefore decided I'm going to repeat less and I'm going to play around with repeated elements and do different things with them to make sure that the reader isn't being told you can skip, it doesn't matter. So for instance, in the Rosy Fingered Dawn line, which is repeated over and over and over in the original, I keep that she's a goddess, she has either roses or blooming, and she has fingers or touching, she's newborn or she's early, but I do different things with how, how those components get mixed up. Um, so just in terms of process, I worked closely with the Greek. As I said, I didn't look at other translations. Um, I read it out loud a lot. I combed through dictionaries and commentaries, trying to figure out what the nuances of every word or phrase might be. Um, and then on a larger scale, I was trying to feel my way inside each of the characters and each of the relationships, each of the scenes, each of the events. 
I wanted all the characters to make the richest, most humanly truthful kind of sense they could make. I wrote multiple drafts, and I read them out loud over and over and over to myself, and also to anybody who would listen. <laughs> and I wanted to, because of course one of my goals was to be sure that this poem could work as something to read out loud, which seems, seemed extra important for a poem that's based on an oral tradition, and which was throughout antiquity experienced primarily orally. So in terms of different perspectives, I felt it was essential, and this was also what something I felt when looking at other translations at the start of the project, um, that there's this tendency, I think, to, to present the Odyssey as if it's always looking only through the eyes of Odysseus. And now logical scholars, especially of the Odyssey, have, over the last few decades, have really drawn our, our attention, the attention of academics of work on Homer, to the fact that the narrative perspectives in Homer are constantly shifting, that we're not always seeing through the point of view of Odysseus. We're seeing through one point of view, and then it shifts, and then it shifts again. So I wanted to try and be, um, to be really thoughtful about that, really attuned to the way it's a poem which has many different voices, many different perspectives, and they don't all sound the same, they don't all agree with each other. I wanted to make sure the reader could feel her way inside the perspectives of every character in the poem, not just Odysseus, Penelope, Telemachus, Athena, the most obvious and elite characters, but even the minor ones, like Alpinor, the boy who gets drunk and falls to his death, or the, or the many slaves, who, all of whom, are, are, all of the, there are at least four who are very clearly um, de described and very rounded characters. All the suitors, Antinous and Eurymachus, who are clearly defined as different from each other. All the various characters Odysseus meets along the way, like Calypso or Alphemus. I think the original poem allows us to feel for and understand each of them. I think Homer has this amazingly broad set of, set of sympathies that we don't just see through one person's eyes. We, we can feel for multiple different people in the community. Um, the Odyssey is, of course, the story about one man's journey home, his one man's nostos, which is the word for journey home in Greek. But it's also about the, all these other nostoi, all these other journeys home, which most of which don't happen. The men who leave, 12 boats load, load, load loads of men who leave Ithaca to go to Troy with Odysseus, zero come home. Um, they don't have a nostos, as the first page of the poem reminds us. This is a story about one man who did make it home and all the others who didn't. We're also shown all the slaves who don't have a home anymore. Um, we're also shown the ways that Odysseus' nostos is experienced differently by all those that it affects. Penelope's perspective on her marriage is not at all the same as Odysseus's perspective on his. I felt, looking at other translations, there can be a tendency to sentimentalize the marriage that's at the heart of this poem, which I think very often involves subsuming her perspective to his, rather than being clear-minded about the way that the poem can see both sides, and can see also the pain that's inherent in her social position. In the broadest outline, I wanted to create a version of the Odyssey that would be clear, readable, poetic, musical, and that would encourage and invite a critical, nuanced response to the story it's telling. I've seen from teaching the Odyssey that there can be a tendency to assume that it's a sort of old-school comic book superhero story mm -hmm. about the unproblematically heroic male Western hero, and basically proto-white, who's good because he crushes the bad guys and monsters and foreigners, and understands the value of hospitality, which apparently was important back in the ancient days, <laughs> when that sound, which you can name. The story has a happy ending, because the good guy gets back with the objectified wife, and regains all his wealth and all his slaves and all his consumer goods. So it's a nice celebration of family values, consumerism, patriarchy, war, superiority of normal male white people over foreigners and women. <laughs> I'm not going to, I said the start, like, when I started talking a few minutes ago, I was like, really like the Odyssey. And I, I hope it's maybe implicit in what I just said, that I wouldn't like it if I felt that was the only thing it was doing. <laughs> um, I don't think one should like it if that, if that were the only thing it's doing. I think it's doing a whole lot more than that. It's, just, it's presenting Odysseus' perspective on his own story, and also the perspectives of all the other people who are not Odysseus, and how their perspectives are actually quite different from his. Um, so I guess a concrete example of um, how I think complexity can be brought out or else not brought out in translation is that I use the word slave for words that definitely mean slave, but are commonly rendered with either servants or maids or housekeepers, not just in previous translations, but also in ones that have come out after mine. There have been a couple of translations that came out in 2018, and which are still using the word servants for translation for, for uh, words that definitely mean slaves. And I don't think it's that the translators don't know any Greek, I think they know some Greek, but I, don't, I think there's a systematic blindness 
They can be motivated by a desire to idealize the society of Homer in a kind of misguided way, to simplify the poem's, I think, really rich social and ethical thinking by euphemizing elements that might seem disturbing. I think a poem is actually better if we can, is the better for the fact that it's clear-minded about um, multiple different people's perspectives, multiple different people's sufferings, as well as multiple different people's joy. Um, so I thought, um, all, I just, so I just talked in a kind of abstract way. I thought before we have questions, maybe I should read a couple of passages, just to maybe, uh, I'm not sure what, what, what exactly it illustrates, but it'll, it'll be illuminating in some way or other for the people who haven't yet read um, any of my translation. I'm, I say yet, but you don't have to read it if you don't want to. So first I'm going to read a, um, the bit from book 12, which in you know, some ways is the most well-known. People who haven't read the Odyssey or haven't read it for many years, um, you may have the idea that this is a poem that's all about Odysseus wandering around in a boat and meeting lots of, lots of scary monsters. Um, so this is one of those bits where Odysseus um, meets the, um, first the Sirens and then Scylla and Charybdis. And it's a passage where, um, which, which I think sort of frames a central question of the Odyssey, which is about how adaptable or how versatile is Odysseus? Is he going to be, go on trying to be the warrior that was the appropriate response to being in the middle of a battlefield where everyone's trying to kill you? Or is he going to be able to adapt to deal with different kinds of threats, some of whom don't carry bronze spears and might not be appropriate, with, might, hurling a bronze spear might not be the appropriate response? So I think it's a passage which sort of frames the question of does Odysseus really want to be that warrior self or can he be other selves? What other selves are there that can respond to different kinds of threats? And it's also a passage which frames um, what I think is another of, of many interesting threads in the Odyssey. One, another interesting thread is about the dangers to the male protagonist of female mouths. So we have the first the mouths of the sirens which are tempting Odysseus with the possibility of total knowledge, of having something like the internet, or having something like, um, but the internet in which every Google search, the, the answer is Odysseus. Um, so it's, 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 it's both um, total knowledge and total salvation for the ego that the sirens promise him. But they promise it with this da these dangerous female mouths, of course, if he were to stay and yield to that temptation, he wouldn't have a journey home. And then we have two, we have then Scylla, who has six mouths, all of which are cannibal mouths. And then we have Charybdis, the whirlpool, who's all mouth, but all she does is drink. So we have these, these three goddesses who frame the, the problems of um, female mouths, female orifices. And of course, we get versions of that, um, that danger figured differently in the more realistic books when we're back in Ithaca. Okay, so this is um, Odysseus explaining to his subordinates um, that Circe has given some instructions about how to deal with the sirens. Then with an anxious heart, I told the crew, my friends, the revelations Circe shared with me should not be kept a secret, known to me alone. I will share them with you, and we can die in knowledge of the truth, or else escape. She said we must avoid the voices of the otherworldly sirens, steer past their flowering meadow. And she says that I alone should hear their singing. Bind me to keep me upright at the mast, found drowned with rope. If I beseech you and command you to set me free, you must increase my bonds and chain me even tighter. So I told them each detail. Soon our well-built ship, blown fast by fair winds, neared the island of the sirens, and suddenly the wind died down. Calm came. Some spirit lulled the waves to sleep. The men got up, pulled down the sails, and stowed them in the hollow hold. They sat at oar and made the water whiten, struck by polished wood. I gripped a wheel of wax between my hands and cut it small. Farm kneading and the sunlight warmed it, and then I rubbed it in the ears of each man in his turn. They bound my hands and feet, straight upright at the mast. They sat and hit the sea with oars. We travelled fast, and when we were in earshot of the sirens, they knew our ship was near and started singing. Odysseus, come here. You are well known for many stories. Glory of the Greeks. Now stop your ship and listen to our voices. All those who pass this way, 
dear, honeyed song, poured from our mouths. The music brings them joy, and they go on their way with greater knowledge. Since we know everything, the Greeks and Trojans suffered in Troy by God's will, and we know whatever happens anywhere on earth. Their song was so melodious, I longed to listen more. I told the men to free me. I scowled at them, but they kept rowing on. Eolicus and Perimedes stood and tied me even tighter with more knots. But when we were well past them, and I could no longer hear the singing of the sirens, I nodded to my men, and they removed the wax that I had used to plug their ears and untied me. When we had left that island, I saw a mighty wave and smoke and heard a roar. The men were terrified. Their hands let fall the oars. They splashed down in the water. The ship stayed still, since no one now was pulling the slender blades. I strode along the deck, pausing to cheer each man. They gave a speech to value all of them. Dear friends, we are experienced in danger. This is not worse than the time the Cyclops captured us and forced us to remain inside his cave. We got away that time thanks to my skill and brains and strategy. <laughs> Remember that! Come on then, all of you, and trust my words. Sit on your benches, strike the swelling deep with oars, since Zeus may grant us a way out from this disaster also. Pilot, listen, these are your orders. As you hold the rudder, direct the ship away from that dark smoke and rising wave, and head towards the rock. If the ship veers the other way, it will endanger us. They promptly followed orders. I did not mention Scylla, since she meant inevitable death. And if they knew, <laughs> the men would drop the oars and go and huddle down in the hold in fear. <laughs> then I ignored Circe's advice that I should not bear arms. It was too hard for me. I dressed myself in glorious armor. In my hands I took two long spears and I climbed up on the forecastle. I thought that Rocky Scylla would appear from that direction to destroy my men. So we rode through the narrow strait in tears. On one side, Scylla. On the other, shining Charybdis with a dreadful, gurgling noise sucked down the water. When she spewed it out, she seethed, all churning like a boiling cauldron on a huge fire. The froth flew high to spatter the topmost drops on either side. But when she swallowed back the sea, she seemed all stirred from inside, and the rock around was roaring dreadfully, and the dark blue sand below was visible. The men were seized by fear. But while our frightened gaze was on Charybdis, Sil snatched six men from the ship, my strongest, best fighters. Looking back from down below, I saw their feet and hands up high as they were carried off. In agony, they cried to me and called my name. Their final words, as when a fisherman, out on a cliff, casts his long rod and line set round with oxhorn to trick the little fishes with his bait, but when it's caught, he flings it gasping back onto the shore. So those men gasped as Scylla lifted them up high to her rocky cave, and at the entrance, ate them up, still screaming, still reaching out to me in their death throes. That was the most heartrending sight I saw in all the time I suffered. Scene. Okay, so I'm thinking we should have question time now, right? Because we need to have enough time so you can ask questions. <laughs> what each diphthong has sounded, I have no idea. Um, and of course I don't. And of course, if also we don't know about um, the accentuation and how it might have shifted over the course of centuries. We don't know that. Um, I mean, I, I love how I, based on whatever scholarship I've read about pronunciation of Homer, 
can um, put together what it sounds. And, I, and of course, I'm aware that's fiction. Yes, or at least it's a it's a reconstruction which might or might not be right. Yes. Yes. When you're doing the reading, you're doing these wonderful voices mm -hmm. for the characters who are speaking. When you translated, did you think of characters in different dramatic voices? Like Penelope sounds a certain way that's different. Um, I, I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't, when I was reading out loud to myself in the process, put on the silly voices that I put on, but, <laughs> on the show. <laughs> um, but I definitely, I mean, I, I see the, um, the performer development now is, is meant to be a, um, sort of corresponds to, I thought hard about, about um, character arc and character perspective, which I didn't necessarily always think of in terms of which voice would I put on when I do that. I mean, that, that's the sort of later, um, Incrustation on the in the, in the process, yeah, um, but I definitely thought about like, how how do I want both how do I want the character to sound, but also what I want the character to be like. What's yeah. nice about it is they in the translation they seem different. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like the narrator is reading all the voices. Good. Well, I hope I hope it seems, it seems different <laughs> even on the page. Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. You, uh, wait, 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 wait. Yes. Um, um, I loved your description of how you went about this enormous task and mm -hmm. and your and summary of what you trying to bring to this work. And I wondered, as you were talking about that, what was your biggest challenge? What was the thing that you struggled most with? There were so many struggles all the time. I mean, the whole thing was struggle. I think the whole, the whole thing was both joy and struggle all the time. Um, and then it's, it's hard to put it in sort of macroscopic word, ways. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time just think, thinking about synonyms, thinking about how, um, here are all these words for moving quickly through space. None of them are quite the same as any English word for quick, moving quickly through space. And I can't just say washing all the time because that makes everybody sound too New Yorkish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, I mean, that kind of thing, I don't mean that as, as the only example, but just as a, you know, a thousand things kind of like that. I, I, it's, it wasn't that, um, I mean, it could, it, most of the time it would be, this is a very easy, straightforward passage of Greek. It's not difficult to understand what it's saying. It's not even difficult to understand what it's doing on a level of, um, I can see the various effects with the rhythms and the alliterations and so on. But then how do I put that into something which does some of the same things? That, that was very, very difficult. Yeah. I, that's, 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 that's. Yes, could you just um, take us through what, how you got the complicated in the first sure. line? Sure, yes. Yes. <laughs> so the word I translate as complicated is polythrop polythropos, polythropon is an acoustic case. Um, so polu, as in polygamy, means many, and tropos is, is cognate with the verb to turn. So it suggests some, something like much turny. Much turny is not an English word. So I didn't want to use something that's not an English word. I wanted to use something which is definitely um, an actual word, because polytropos is an actual word, not a made-up made up thing. Um, and also, English doesn't um, do nearly as many compound words, um, melding different bits together, as German or Hebrew Greek does. So that was also, in general, a problem, but it was a problem for this in particular as well. Um, so I wanted something that would convey something or other that was not just about Odysseus, but also about the poem and about the journey because um, we know from later usage of polytropos that at least later on it was used to describe situations as well as people. So it, it seems to me that the use of this, not the most common epithet of Odysseus in the first line, there's something potentially programmatic about that. Um, it's saying something about what kind of poem is the Odyssey. It's a much turny kind of poem. Um, so I wanted something that would, be, that would say something about what is, this, what is this poem and what is this translation. What am I trying to get the reader to watch out for? I'm trying to say watch out for complexity. Um, I went through different possibilities in terms of um, if I want to keep a metaphor of turnedness and I want a real English word, there are many that are just not usable. Right? I mean, if I can't say kinky man or perverted man. Right? <laughs> those have the right metaphor, but they don't mean the right thing. Um, so I felt that complicated in a way was a kind of compromise because it has a let a it, it, it implies layeredness. It doesn't necessarily imply quite the same kind of turning. But I, and it, but I felt I couldn't quite get to all the things, all the bases I wanted to touch unless I made some kind of compromise, and that was the, the best I could do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, you said when you looked at the Greek text, 
you saw there were a lot of things you would do differently. Is there a single decided uh, Greek authoritative text, or did you have to decide among which Greek texts? I just used the Oxford text um, primarily. I mean, occasionally I looked at others, but I mostly just relied on that. Um, and I was aware that, again, if I were going to do a re-edition, then it would you know, take another 20 years, and that would be a whole other process. Yes. And that I was just going to have to rely on a standard text. And what is the origin of that? The, the, I don't know that text. What does it date from? Or? The Oxford text is it's one of the modern editions. It's, like, like all modern editions, it's based on the work of the Homeric scholars of antiquity, the scholars who worked on the text of Homer in the Library of Alexandria in the second or third century. Right? Just, so that's when the texts of Homer were sort of established as in a nailed, more, more nailed down way than they had been in earlier centuries. Um, in your translation, you use the word goddess a lot for Calypso, mm -hmm. while in other translations they use nymph. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if that was like a personal choice, or it was sort of like how people use certain sort of slave, mm -hmm. or because of it, yeah. I am the pentameter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in that case, definitely not the second, because obviously if you're trying to write a pentameter for a hexameter, it's, you're, you're motivated to go from one syllables. So I knew it would have been easy, but I didn't use it very much, <laughs> despite the fact it would have been useful. Because I, I, th I see nymph as kind of a false friend. Nympha suggests goddess, and Calypso is definitely a goddess. Nymph in English suggests um, a female person whose sexual desire should be mocked, right? I mean, it's just nympho. And that's not actually what, it's not at all um, truthful to the way that Calypso is being depicted in Book 5, that she's not being depicted as um, she's hysterical, there's something wrong with her, she shouldn't, um, she shouldn't want him. She's being depicted as a very powerful female divine being. So I think, I think goddess gets to powerful female divine being better than nymph does. So, yeah. Yes? So, uh, one of the many things that intrigues me is, uh, is the discoveries in a somewhat pre-modern Serbia in the 1930s where there were living extant epic mm -hmm. Poems that and, and people who were in that mode, and the, uh, I forget the name of the person who went there. Norman Parry. Norman Parry. Norman Parry. Parry. And it's it's amazing that these uh, traditions could have lived on into a pre-modern Serbia. Mm -hmm. It is yes, yes. So, so uh, for people who don't know, the 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 study of the the Homeric question, the whole study of how did we get the poem that we get? How did it come into being out of an oral tradition? That, that was all, um, a, lo a lot of progress was made on that question in, in the early 20th century by the researches of both Milman Parry and his student Albert Lord, who went and studied the living oral tradition in what was then Yugoslavia and realized that certain components of Homeric verse are clearly features of oral poetry. But then, I mean, since then, people have done studies of you know, other oral traditions around the world. I mean, there's the Sintiata, <coughs> the Epic of Mali. Um, there, there are other sort of equivalents. And one thing that's been emphasized in those researches is that they're not all the same. That, I mean, if you just take Homer and the Serbian traditions and you try and find comparisons, and you think everything that's similar is going to be what all oral, oral, oral traditions are like, then you actually, it's, that's wrong, because there are all traditions which are not quite like that. So, that, so it, it doesn't solve all the, all the questions you might want to have answered about Homeric poetry. Um, and of course, it's also, it's also kind of a problem for that way of um, solving the Homeric problems that there are too many people who are literate in the world now. You know, it, would be, it would be good if there were more societies where there was no knowledge of reading or writing. Of course, that, that, that's, that's kind of gone. gone. How, in the process of translation, how did your relationship with English, the English language, change? Mm -hmm. And are you planning to translate the Iliad? <laughs> <laughs> um, second question, yes. Um, oh, you are. Yes, I, uh, yes, I started. Um, and first question, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, obviously, this, I mean, writing this wasn't the only English writing or English speaking I was doing. Um, so, so, <laughs> um, I think, it, I mean, the, the fact that I was sort of trying to write in this particular way for this particular project and also trying to create what in a way is a fairly stripped down version of English, but, but because I'm trying to create a fairly simple direct syntax 
and I end up using quite a lot of monosyllables because I'm using, writing pentameters that have to fit um, to be equivalent to, he to hexameters. Um, I may be conscious of the wealth of resources in English for fairly short, direct words. And that even though I also spent a lot of time um, reading the Surai and trying to figure out what other words are that I could use, what other phrases are there that I could use that might be in something like this general field, it, it made me aware of, um, of how there's a whole lot you can do in English, even if you don't use a lot of words like complicated. I mean, I, I use some words that are longer, like complicated. But even if you don't use that many, you don't have to sound like Peter and Jane K. Ball, even if you do use a very stiff bad English. So just to say, I, I just love the translation. It's really a pleasure and exciting to read. But are you a student of um, James Joyce also? I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a student. I mean, I've, I've read Ulysses. I, I taught it once, years and years yeah. ago. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a Joyce scholar, though. No. But I love jokes. It's in the Rosenbach. Yes, it is. In the Rosenbach, yes. I went to talk to the Rosenbach for a while. Yes. I love jokes. Yes. I'm the first time Odyssey reader. And I was struck uh, by how um, Odysseus doesn't enter the scene until book, book five. Book I mean, five. we get references to him earlier, but book yeah, five. Yes. I was just fascinated by yes. the fact that it starts with Telemachus. So yes. what do you. <laughs> how do you, how do you, it, it's a really interesting structure, yes. and... I completely agree, it's a fascinating structure. So people talk about the Telemachy, the first four books of the poem are the journey of, of Telemachus, not to find his actual father, but to find some kind of news about his father. And of course, in the way, along the way, to, to have a journey that will be in some way parallel to his father's journey, um, that will involve some kind of community building, and also will involve um, some awareness that the reader was also going to get about how are different homes different. But of course, in the course of Odysseus's journey, we're going to glimpse how some fantastical and non weak homes are all different from each other. That the home of the goddess Calypso is different from the home of the goddess Circe. <coughs> Whereas in Telemachus's journey, we also, in a, on a much smaller scale, we see how even among the veterans of Troy, who are all within the same community, um, cultures and foodways and the ways you set up your household are very different from each other. We see a big contrast between the house of Ithaca, the house of um, Nestor, the much, much more traditional house of Nestor, the poor, barren, stony house of Ithaca, Telemachus and his mama being bullied, and then the rich, um, nouveau riche house of Menelaus. So I think it's also just about the way that the poem is interested in storytelling and in this very complicated mode of storytelling. But it, it certainly doesn't go from here you are starting with the start of Odysseus' journey when he first leaves Troy and then dot, 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 you'll go year by year in a sort of analytic way. It's very much the opposite of analytic. Um, and in a way, the Iliad does similar things. I mean, I think it's more obvious with the Odyssey that it's, it's all a process of circles and backtracking and inset narratives. But even the Iliad has some sort of really interesting awareness of narrative and of how you can tell a huge story in a tiny story. I think that what you describe as the stripped down language that you're using is ravishingly beautiful. And then Thank what you. makes it even more beautiful is that every once in a while you'll drop in a word like the word I looked up in my reading this morning, ossifrage. I love that. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you choose those archaic words? What, what, why in that moment do you reach for a word that the reader has to go and look for? Uh, yes. Um, I don't feel like I had a general rule about how to do that. I mean, I mean part of me wanted to do it kind of more than I ended up doing, and there was always sort of, maybe this is one, one of the many things I struggled with, is how many times can I get away with doing that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think if it's the, if it's the um, epiphany of a goddess, you can, you can afford to put in a magical work, um, but you can't put in too many because then you lose the magic. But I, but I hardly wanted it, I was saying at the start that one of the things I love about the Odyssey is the way that it has both this very pragmatic concreteness and also the sense that there are goddesses walking among us. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something like that linguistically by having this sense that sometimes it's all very easily comprehensible, and then, oh, that's a weird word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, too, uh, love this translation. And one of the things that made it so wonderful to read was the alliteration. I'm wondering if the Homeric Greek 
had that much alliteration, which seems to be throughout <coughs> your, uh, your translation. Yes, the Hamad does have, have a lot of alliteration. And um, so, for instance, in the passage I just read, um, I alliterate a lot in, for instance, the description of Charybdis, which I hope we're going to. I mean, uh, but, the, but the original also alliterates a lot in the description of Charybdis. I don't think it's ab absolutely sort of consistent that it's always as alliterative. I think there's, there's a piling on of alliteration at particular moments. I mean, the, very often similes and descriptive passages have, have more alliteration than, um, than, than some speeches do. Um, but, but yes, it's, it's, even though in some ways Homeric verse has a kind of simplicity to it, it's not full of very, very ornate rhetorical figures um, in a Miltonic way. It, it, de it definitely has um, poetic features, and one of them is, I mean, even if we don't know exactly how the vowel sounds um, work, we can still tell there's alliteration here. Yes. yes. Not to go crazy with the feminist question, but what do you think of the theory, was it Samuel Butler, that the Odyssey might have been written by a woman? <laughs> yes, so Samuel Butler, the novelist who wrote um, Erewhon and also did a prose translation of the Odyssey, wrote this crazy little pamphlet called The Authoress of the Odyssey, in which he argues that um, the Odyssey was by a headstrong Sicilian girl. <laughs> and you can tell that from various clues. <laughs> One of which is that the, there's not much fighting, and what there is is no good. It's not, it's not so good. <laughs> so it's by a girl. And also there are, a lot of, there are a lot of female characters, and only a girl would be interested in that kind of thing. <laughs> so I, I don't think any of those are particularly compelling arguments given that we don't have evidence for, I mean, both for their sexism, but also because we don't have evidence for um, female ioidoi or female rhapsodes in the archaic Greek world. Um, I mean, of course, we have the was Sapper. It's not that a woman couldn't be a poet in archaic Greece, but we also don't have evidence for how different was archaic Lesbos from whatever the cultures were in which this poem was being produced. I don't know. I, just, I think it would be nice to imagine that Homer is a woman, but I think it's just a fantasy. There wasn't any evidence for it. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Um, so going back to the feminist question, the, the authors that have endorsed you at the back are yes. all women. Yes. Was that on purpose, or was that the publisher picked the quotes, not me? But I think I think it's part. By the way, my lovely quotes. <laughs> my lovely women. Um, I. I think there's a combination of things. One is that um, I think books by women tend to get sent to women reviewers much more than books by men do, right? I mean, if I, if I were a man, I think it would have been reviewed much more widely by men. Um, I, I think it's great that it's a way of um, re sort of packaging Homer so that it says um, this, uh, doesn't, this is not a book which is only by and for men and only endorsed by men. I mean, I think, I think it's a way of sort of flagging what the, one of the things the cover also flags, which is that this is relevant to women. Um, and it, um, female voices are going to be listened to. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not sure we are now. Is there an audio version, or is there going It's to coming, be? next week, I think. Yes. Are you <laughs> there, right? No, Claire Danes. Claire Danes. She may not do the silly voices, but she's, a, she's actually good at acting, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you talked a little about the, complica the complication of polytropos. Yes. I was wondering if um, polymatus or matus in general sent you around and around in the same kind of way, or if that was easier? Oh yes, I mean, all of, it's not that everybody focuses on the first line because yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't read very much to get to that. <laughs> but it's not that it's the only epithet I worried about. I worried yeah. about all of them every, every time, yes. And I did different things with, with, with the different epithets um, on every occasion. So similarly, with, as with Dawn, I tried to sort of explore what are the different, what's the range of different things that metas can imply and do different things with it when it popped up differently and try and think through how might I use this epithet, how might this epithet be functioning to shape this scene in a different way um, from the way that the epithet might function in a different scene. Yes. So I, I, have, I, I don't have a full list of everything I did with polymetrics, but I did different things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was just wondered since you said you were planning to do the Iliad, why you chose to do the Odyssey first? They asked me first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's partly because the Odyssey gets onto a more literature syllabus. 
So from, from Norton's perspective, because of course it's the foundational for more of world literature than the Iliad is. Um, as, as in, for instance, the, no, you can read it alongside Joyce, um, which it would be weird to read the Iliad alongside Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, since you wrote the book that you uh, look at your translation and translations that were previously done, yeah. was there something to that whole process that just kind of struck you over and over again in terms of how you looked at something and translated an event versus a different translator who were all men? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I, 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 I've done some like, little threads on Twitter but where I've done close comparisons of different bits and comparing mine to other translations. And I always feel, feel like I learn things by doing that. It's an interesting exercise. I, I, don't, I don't feel like I have a macroscopic idea about what I'm going to find out when I do the exercise of just open it and look at how different people did a different passage. Um, so, I mean, I guess... We talked about Calypso, and I, I was kind of struck by how many people bo both use the word nymph, but also then I think the word nymph can infect the reading of the of the scene. And that it can, it, I think quite a lot of translations sort of treat Calypso as more ridiculous because they they have the word English ideas of nymph in their minds, which are, are aren't actually there in the Greek. Um, I mean, I guess comparably. Um, looking at the scene when Telemachus decides that he's not going to hack, the, hack to the, the slave women who've been raped by the citizens, but instead hang them because they're too dirty for his sword. Um, and I, I was really surprised to realize how many translators add in, they make Telemachus call them things like sluts, when the Greek doesn't do that, it doesn't do anything like that. Um, and I think it's about a reading of, of a passage, I myself hadn't articulated before doing that research exercise, that. My, I read the passage differently from the way I think quite a lot of translators have read it, and, and commentators too. But I don't think Telemachus is thinking um, these are people who are, whose sexuality is bad and, to, and they're going to be punished for their sexuality by being hanged. I think he's instead thinking and saying, I feel ashamed by the continued existence of these um, bodies that have been claimed by other men. And that what he's insisting on is erasing his own sense of shame. So I, I, even beyond the fact I don't think I, I didn't feel any push to put in the word slut where it wasn't where there wasn't anything like that in the Greek, I also felt that my perspective on the scene I realised in retrospect is not the same as that of other. <coughs> time just to figure out what's my idiom. And then it, it got a little easier as it went on, but it, it, was, it was five years pretty solid work. And along the same line, is it necessary to concentrate totally on one project like this, or did you, did you do other things? I did other things. I mean, I, so at the start I was finishing up a book about Seneca um, while I was starting this. And I, actually one of the reasons I love translation so much, there are many reasons, but one is that you can do a couple of lines. You know, if you only have you know, half an hour to need to pick the kids up, you can still do two lines. Um, whereas if it's writing a chapter, you can't write three sentences of your chapter and then you know, it's a different kind of process. I wonder at this point if you know what kind of course adoption it's getting in high school. So many of us read it then or in junior high, and maybe you don't know if the publisher if you're here knows. I, I think it, I think it's getting adopted quite a lot. I mean, it, the, the paperback only just came out, so um, I mean it was it was too expensive for most schools to get when it was in hardback. So I think we we kind of have to wait and see how it does. But now that it's cheaper, <coughs> but I, I think I mean I've talked to a lot of high school teachers as as well as. Um, college professors who seem to say about adoption. They do it at Columbia now. Mm -hmm. Even in the hardback, they put it in the hardback. <laughs> 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 Maybe one more question? Or? Sure. Yes. Do you um, have any favorite moments in the story, or are there any moments that you particularly enjoy translating? I love translating. 
getting all the descriptive plots, I guess. I mean, all of the moments when um, there's a description of an, of an action or a preparation of a meal, or when I, what, one favorite is when Hermes is traveling through the waves to get to Calypso's island, and then we have a wonderful description of the crisscross intertwined vines, and it's a place of hiding, and even the streams are hiding other streams. Um, I, I, love, I love doing all the scripture parts, I and mean, I love doing the, the character speeches too, and trying to find different voices for them, but there was a different kind of pleasure in the parts where it's um, sort of more meta about cloth, where right? you're thinking both about um, how do I describe this physical object, but also how is the description, how, like, what, what makes it feel like, feel like I'm, I'm really authoritative about um, how, you, how you get a ship moving on the ocean, even though I have to feel like It was really fun. Thank you so much.